Hello and thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Uh, today's episode is a very special one. Twice a year, a conference called the Idea Exchange takes place in Birmingham in the UK. The Idea Exchange is a leadership development and networking event for leaders of young people, of young adults and families from across the UK. They come together and are equipped by some of the UK's most prominent Christian leaders who are, have bring their experience and their wealth of expertise just to really build up the leaders who come and partake in the event. The most recent event took place in October 2015. There were three amazing speakers, Dr. Carver Anderson, Pastor Kurt McAteer, and Pastor Mark Foster. And the teaching was truly transformational. In today's session, you're going to hear from one of those three speakers as they share with you the insights and and lessons and the subject of how we create a God-honoring culture in our churches. How do we create a God-honoring culture that attracts and engages young people? Take a listen as they share with you. And without further ado, we're going to introduce our first speaker today. Our first speaker, Mark Foster. I met Mark back in about 2008, I think it was. I studied at Audacious Church in Manchester, where Mark's from. He's an assistant pastor there. Um, I did this, a thing called the Leadership Academy. That was, In fact, it was the first year that Audacious Church began, wasn't it, I think, in Manchester. When I was there, there's about 60 people or so in the church when I, in that first year. Now there's like how many thousand? 3,000 people that meet at the church every single weekend. There are churches that are in our country that are struggling right now, struggling with numbers, struggling to grow, struggling to make a difference, make an impact. There are churches that are maintaining, they're kind of just there, you know, they're kind of just every Sunday maintaining the same status quo. And then there are churches that are impacting, that are transforming, that are expanding, that are growing, that are enlarging. And when I think of churches in our country that are doing just that, I think of Audacious Church and the amazing team of leaders they've got at that church in Manchester right now. For us to have Mark here today is a privilege. I want us to really have a sense of expectation this morning. I want you to draw out of him, you know. I want you to pull out of him. At Audacious is a culture where when the speaker is speaking, we respond, all right? So, you know, in, in Afro-Caribbean churches, if someone, says, if someone preaches and you agree with what they say, what do you say? What else do you say? Well, hey, come on. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. And you know, and it's amazing what's going on right there is an exchange between us, the audience, and the preacher. And as we respond to the preacher, we pull out of the preacher, we encourage the preacher, and he preaches better. Don't ask me how it happens. It just happens. So I want to encourage you guys that as he's preaching today, as he's sharing his heart today about um, engaging youth co- and engaging youth culture, I want you to just begin to respond. Of course, have your pen in hand, your paper in hand, take notes. And just, hey, let's just thank God for Mark as he comes. Let's, let's clap for him as he comes. Come on. Amazing. All right. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here in Birmingham. I'm actually a Midlander as well. So I uh, grew up in Stratford-upon-Avon, and uh... <laughs> all right, let's just move on. <laughs> My sister lives in Birmingham right now. Hey, yeah, pulled it back. Um, I forget what area she lives in. Begins with an S. No. Selly Oak, could be Selly Oak. Yeah, I think it's there. Good. Amazing. Well, it's good to be here. Came from Chester. We've just started. Um, Audacious Church has been going for eight years in Manchester. Just celebrated our eighth birthday a couple of weekends ago, which was great. And we're literally just on the edge of starting Audacious Church in Chester, which is around 40 minutes from Manchester. And we're super excited about that. So last night I was in Chester running a life group, which is our small groups that meet midweek in Chester. Seeing God doing doing amazing things. And uh, I guess I'm guessing why Errol's invited me. But it's about our church. Our church is kind of like a youth at heart church. We're not a youth church by any stretch of the imagination. We're not a young people's church. Uh, we're not any demographic. 
um, church. We are just a young at heart church. So any person that that wants to uh, be enthusiastic, passionate about Jesus, wants to express their faith in church, but more importantly, outside of church, the four walls of, then uh, they're the people that can call Audacious Church home. And so in uh, some aspects, we are hopefully we're, we're uh, increasing in, in our engagement with young people. And so today's really just to share what I can in the next 40 minutes. So I just apologize at the start of the message. I'm not going to be around for the rest of the day. I've got a flight to get and we need to leave at 10.30. So I've got 45 minutes. So we're going to go hard. We're going to go fast. And uh, that's the best way to go. So open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. We're going to look at Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2. I really think there's some stuff in here that we can learn in terms of creating an environment, creating a culture of engagement with young people and accessibility for young people. But one of the key things, I guess, we've, I've been a part of conversations like this before in my past life as a youth pastor in Sheffield, and then the first year and a half in Manchester, I was running the youth ministry there. And often conversations about engaging youth and youth culture and being a part of that, attracting young people to church, often the conversation can easily get to a point of what do we need to compromise in order to engage young people? What are the things that we need to not do that happen on a Sunday in church that we shouldn't do because they're not going to really speak to young people on, on a Friday or whenever our youth ministries happen? And so it can be really easy to get in the trap of uh, watering down everything that we are, every, the, the one thing that we do have that's Jesus Christ, and watering that down to a point where we become so bland and tasteless that however culturally relevant in the things that we're doing with our hand are, people just aren't engaging because there's no message for them to engage with. So I think at the start of the day, it's really important for us to remind ourselves and remember what are the things that we cannot compromise on? What are the things that are non-negotiables for us in our youth ministries? I made a decision as a youth pastor that I was never going to compromise on a, a creating an environment of encounter with God. However long I was going to be running youth ministry, that, and whatever we were going to do creatively, uh, whatever we were going to do attractionally, we were never going to compromise on creating opportunities for young people to encounter God. And uh, when I look at Acts, we see a, a church that exploded overnight from one message. 3,000 people made a decision, uh, became followers of the way, followers of Jesus Christ in a moment. And it was an encounter. It was an experience that, that kind of created this overflow and this church that boomed. And you read all of Acts and there's no mention of youth ministry. There's no mention of trying to water down any message or, or make things a little bit more culturally relevant. Everything they did was one church, one thing, one message, and, uh, and uh, nothing was watered down. So we're going to look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42, verse 47, super quick, and then rewind to Acts chapter 1. And uh, this passage, verse 42 to verse 47, for us at Audacious Church, for me, is one of our favorite passages just on uh, on what church is. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need every day. They continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. There's a message there, glad. Church should be a glad place should be a place full of joy, fun, energy, life, sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Who wants verse 47 in their life? The Lord added to their number daily 
those being saved. We all want that, don't we? We're on the same page with that. We are all in this room to think, to have ideas, to exchange ideas, to exchange contact details, to exchange wins, uh, to exchange mistakes that we've learned from, for the one aim, to see people being added to the local church every single day, making decisions for Jesus Christ. We all want that. And so my question is, if that was normal for this church, what have we lost that that's now not normal? What is it about this church that what was their mindset? What was the culture of church? What was the mentality in order that they, as a natural overflow, because it's almost just an added statement. Oh, and by the way, the Lord added to their number daily those being saved. What? (laughs) You know, in 2015, we're like, hang on a minute. Surely that should be in bold. But it's just like an added on, oh, yeah, and because of all that stuff, This was just normal reality for the church. So I just want us to flick back a page to Acts chapter 1. And I I think there's some things at the beginning of the writing of the book of Acts that really help us to see what was just a normal mindset, normal culture, uh, normal environment. uh, environment. So we're going to read Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to verse 8, and then we're going to pull some things out from there. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, speaking of Jesus, he showed himself to these men and he gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and he spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, for which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or dates the father has set, by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Powerful scripture. We know this. We all know this scripture well. The moment, uh, the promise of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus spoke of it to the disciples, asked them to go to a place and wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. I think there's some things in here that just give us great insight into what it is about engaging culture uh, with the church. The first thing I want to pick up on is they create an environment of vision, potential, and possibility. Create an environment of vision, potential, and possibility. In verse 1 of Acts chapter 1, it says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote all about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until he was taken up to heaven. In my former book, writing to Theophilus, does anyone know who, who the book of Acts was written by? Luke, right. So anyone just have a wild stab in the dark of what his former book was? <laughs> just, just go for it. Just step out in faith. Luke, good, the gospel of Luke. So Luke's writing here in my former book, Theophilus, which is the book of Luke. I couldn't think of a better title at the time, you know, and so my sequel's a lot better. I've thought about it, but the first book, I just thought, let's just stick my name on there, you know, it keeps me in the records for years to come. In my former book, the book of Luke, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do. How many people have read the book of Luke? Yeah. In, in Luke, Luke records a miraculous conception, Mary's pregnancy and the birth of Jesus. Luke records Jesus' dedication as a one-week-old baby and him as a young boy in the temple. He records his baptism, his temptation, his return to the town of his boyhood. Luke, Luke records Jesus preaching, teaching with authority, countless healings, driving out demons, walking on water, empowering and sending out his team. Luke records Jesus changing the rules, raising, thing, raising the bar, turning things on their head. He records a betrayal, rejection of Jesus, his dying moments of pain, his raw human emotion, his desperate prayer, his surrender, his sacrifice. Luke records 
records his death, his burial, and resurrection. He records him destroying the power of death, sin, rejection, and the power of your past. And now Luke says, that is what Jesus began to do. Hello? Talk about creating an environment of vision, potential, and possibility. Our young people are desperate to have hope, future installed into them, that they would know that there is more for them. There's potential, there's possibility for every single young person. I think if we were a church, if we were youth ministries, that our normal default was not to talk about the success or otherwise of the past, not to talk primarily about the challenges of today, but to talk about the potential of the future, Maybe our young people would get on board, would grab a hold of a vision, a greater vision that's bigger than themselves, but also a vision that is for themselves. And maybe they would step into that kind of culture environment and say, wow, if that's for us, I want to be a part of it. If that's ahead of us, then I want to be part of making it happen. John chapter 21 and verse 25, it says, if all the stories about what Jesus did were written, the whole world wouldn't have room for the books that could be written about him. Luke has written it from the beginning to the end of Jesus's life. But the Bible says here through Luke's words, it says that that was just the beginning. It was just the start of what Jesus wanted to do. If this is the start of what Jesus wants to do, come on, we've got great days ahead for the church. I really believe that we are in the greatest days for the church. We're on the cusp of of a new wave. We've seen in the last 20 years how God has moved so powerfully in churches right across the UK. We've seen in the last 10 years how church culture has shifted and changed so much. We are on the edge of something fresh, new, and God is doing a new thing in Birmingham. Birmingham, anyone believe that? So... uh, I don't know about you, I'm really bad at DIYs. Any sympathizers, empathizers, <laughs> one hand, thank you for that Jesus name. But I hate it if I'm starting like an Ikea flat pack. I'm, it's that extreme, okay? <clears throat> but if I'm starting an Ikea flat pack, my wife comes in and looks over my shoulder and starts to chip in with comments of, oh, you've not done that, or that's not happened, or that should have gone there. Anyone else with me? <laughs> if I'm halfway through a project, I don't want someone chipping in and telling me what I should be doing. But I was thinking about that and thinking about my own life. How many times have I almost gone to God, I'm so disappointed with where I'm at? I'm so disappointed with where this youth ministry is at. God, I'm so disappointed. We've been going this long and we've only seen this amount of fruit. There's almost a sense where God, who's working on his church, hello, and his youth ministry, (laughs) he's going, just a minute, I'm just halfway through. Don't, Don't talk about your disappointment and what should have happened and what could have happened and what maybe have happened if we'd just done that. Because I, God, am building my church and I'm only just a little fraction way through the project of this building of the church. What God is doing in your life is only just the beginning. What God is doing in your church is just the start. What God is doing in Birmingham is only just scratching the surface. Let's create an environment of vision, of potential, and possibility. John 14, 12, if we have faith in him, then we will do even greater things than these. Second thing is uh, let's create an environment of encounter. Creating an environment of encounter, I touched on that in the start. One decision I made as a youth pastor is that I wasn't going to compromise on creating an environment of encounter for young people to encounter the presence, tangible, manifest presence of God. Verse 3 of Acts chapter 1, it says, After Jesus' suffering, so he's died, is now risen again, he showed himself to these men, and he gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. I believe that for young people, the greatest testimony they can have is not how culturally relevant our youth ministry was, or the latest Xbox that we've got. You know, we're not still on Xbox. We've now got Xbox One. The greatest testimony they're going to have is a convincing proof through an encounter with Jesus. 
The greatest thing they can have is not an argument, but an encounter. The greatest thing they can have is not just a theological debate, although that can be good. The greatest thing they can have is a real tangible relationship with a God who wants a real relationship with them. No one can argue that away. I can get in conversation with people, and yet I've still, even if nothing else, if if my brain capacity ends, my capacity, my heart relationship with Jesus still goes. And so as much as an argument runs dry and two people reach a point where in some ways there's no compromise, there's no ground taken, once you've encountered the presence of Jesus... You carry that for life. No one can argue that away. Our young people don't need more arguments. Don't need necessarily. It's good, but it's not the end goal and more intelligence. What they need is a connection, personal connection encounter with Jesus Christ. Jesus wanted to show himself to these men. I don't know if you can just go with me a, a little bit and maybe using a little bit of creative license without being a, a heretic, you know, don't stone me. But if we can just go back and imagine this moment, many of these people who had seen Jesus on the cross, on the hill, had watched him. And many of these people who maybe for a period of time, of these dur- duration of these three years of his ministry, for whatever period they had got on board and, uh, you know, seen Jesus, heard, of, uh, heard him preach, heard him teach, heard him tell stories, heard of him, and now find themselves on this hill watching Jesus die on the cross. For many of these people, all of their hopes and dreams would have been dying at the same time. They would have seen this guy who many people had spoken about as the Messiah. This was the one we've been waiting for. They would have been watching him die on that cross thinking it's all over. We're just going to go back to our normal, average, mundane, everyday life. For many of people over the next couple of weeks, they would have just been back in their normal nine to five job, doing their normal routine, getting on with everyday average life. And all of these dreams, all these hopes, everything they had placed all their belief and faith in had just died literally on the cross. So now they're just back into bog standard day to day living. Can you imagine the moment when the Bible says here that Jesus showed himself? Can you imagine that? You, you're just a car mechanic. I know cars weren't, that's creative license. <laughs> you, you're a teacher. You're a mum. You're a businessman. Whatever you're doing in that normal average every day, and then poof, Jesus shows himself and gives some convincing proofs that this is him, resurrected. He is alive. Can you imagine that moment? It expects Holy Spirit to move and empower us. But the Holy Spirit was given to us to break down every wall that's in the church, to send us out the exit door faster than we came in the entrance door. The Holy Spirit was given to us for a moment to gather for the rest of the week to go and make a difference. Our vision as a a church, audacious church, is to be uh, a church Uh, numerically so large that we transform business, education, entertainment and sport, media, family and healthcare, media, politics and spirituality one person at a time. Our vision as a church is not to have great meetings, although we will. Our vision as a church is not to have great life groups, small groups where we're growing together, although we will. Our vision as a church is to make a difference in the major gateways of every city, of every strata of society. We want to make a difference in the business world, in Manchester, in Chester, in the region. We want to make a difference in education right across Greater Manchester. We want to make a difference in family and healthcare. Uh, right now, we, we employ five staff through a project called Safe Families for Children that is literally taking children who are families who... If they have no intervention, no support, no practical help, then they will have to give their children up to adoption. Right now, six of the ten boroughs of Greater Manchester refer families like that to the local church, to us, Audacious Church. 
They say, please, can you come and intervene? Can you t- work with this family? So we've got people in our church that are able for a period of two weeks to take a child in to give the parents respite so they can work on the their marriage, their relationship, restore something, go on a holiday if that's what they need. We've got other people in our church that can get alongside that couple and help them with their relationship, do shopping for them, have coffee with them, whatever it is. We're literally seeing Greater Manchester refer family and health care to the local church. We've got a vision to make a difference in media. We've got a, a vision that says we want to get involved in politics. Just two Sundays ago, we had 20 MPs in our service on a Sunday night. Conservative Party held their conference in Manchester, and they wanted to run their service in our church. And so we held the Conservatives Christian Party service, 20 MPs there talking about faith and how church can engage with politics. We want to see, have a vision as a church that we engage with, not avoid every strata of society. Church is the epicenter of the city. We are not on the fringes trying to get a word in edgeways. We are what the city back 100, 200 years ago, every single City revolved around the church. We were the pioneers of education and health care. We've lost something, but it's time for the church to take back what was our mandate and say we are here not just to have great meetings, not just have great youth ministry, but young people, you are called and equipped to be ministers. Not every one of you come out on altar call for youth. Who wants to be a youth pastor? And two-thirds of the youth group come out to the altar call. Maybe we've seen that. I've been a part of altar calls like that. We've had altar calls. Everyone called to ministry. And we make the highest goal for our young people being on church staff. No. 99% of people in our churches are not called to local church ministry. They are called to full-time ministry in business. They are called to full-time ministry in education. They are called to full-time ministry in their family and in health care. We've got to empower our young people to have a vision of full-time ministry that is whatever they feel God has called and equipped them to do and send them out with that vision. Don't just come expecting God on a Sunday. Expect him in the NHS, which is the largest employer in the UK. You know, let's expect our young people to go out and make a difference in every strata of society. I believe young people getting a hold of that kind of vision, engaging and attracting young people will not be an issue anymore. Because they see that the church is not just another project, that they are a club that they have to commit to. The church is not just another thing to fill their already busy diaries and schedules. The church is the core part of their life that equips them to do life the best way they can do it. Can I pray super quick? And then if you have any questions, I probably won't have the answers, but some of these other guys will. God, we just thank you that you've called and equipped every single one of us. Thank you for this room, people hungry to learn. God, we just thank you. We remind ourselves, God, we we bow our knee. We are followers of Jesus Christ. We are followers way before we're leaders. So today we want to commit ourselves to following you, to learning. God, to expanding our thinking, expanding our culture, our mindset, the environments we create would be more inclusive. There would be larger circles. God, we would create a table where any person can come to. We'd not create exclusive tables, exclusive youth groups, exclusive churches, but rather they'd see the walls have been broken down. We have vision and we create environments of potential and possibility for every young person to equip them and empower them to do life. We pray this day would be so helpful, so empowering, so releasing, so freeing for every person in this room that they go away with one thing that they can action immediately. We thank you, you've called every one of us to go into our world to make a difference. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for listening. The 
Idea Exchange Conference is hosted by Bridgepoint Church based in Birmingham in the UK. To find out more about the, the conference and the church, visit www.bridge-point-church.com. And as always, we ask you to share this audio recording with your colleagues or friends who you think may also be inter- interested in hearing. And um, you can share it directly from the link here, or they can go to the iTunes page where they can search Rising Generation and they'll find it right there. Thank you. God bless you.